Okay, here is the first video or lecture for attraction. I'm going to break it into a lot of parts because there's a lot of information in this section for the next test, but interpersonal attraction, I think if I can find my clicker, I have these four general areas, and today I'm going to focus in, I'm going to get my pen on here, these two right here, affiliation and attraction. I'm going to break apart these two. They're the easiest. And then the last two, it's not that they're harder, there's just more information on sexual attraction. Okay, so affiliation. It's just the basic idea that we congregate or we herd or flock together. So I think I have this on here. We have this tendency to herd or flock. So we call birds flocks and I have these. But if you look at other animals, they flock or herd like alligators or a congregation or a trout or a hover i don't i mean a wombat or a wisdom or a zebras or a dazzle that's so weird we have these things and so animals have this tendency so do we as humans i call it to tribe up for lack of a better term to cro congregate or flock humans are a tribe even though i'm a white boy you know people tribe up picks saxons you know celtic whatever even white people Hill gave four different reasons we affiliate, and I think they have them on here. And if I can put this on here, I have a beehive. So the first one comes from the beehive, which is social comparison. I got to go ask the other bees, what do you think? Especially in fuzzy situations, or right now, like I'm totally Jones and for positive stimulation, or even social support. I mean, on the phone and stuff like that during the coronavirus is okay, but it's not the same as going to church or seeing y'all at school. And then finally, this need for attention, this American need for attention that everybody has included. So maybe all of this kind of varies. Some people need a lot of flocks and some people don't because they're like the hermit. It's like, uh-uh, I don't like being around the flock. And sometimes that's me because I like to hike and get off into nature by myself. Okay, so cultural differences come into play too. In some cultures, they're more collectivist versus individualistic. What does that mean? Some cultures focus on the we, like certain uh, Eastern cultures. Um, America is more of an I culture, me, 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 I look at me, you know. I'll get into Facebook and Twitter later on, but right here in Arizona are the Hopi people. And the Hopi people supposedly do not have any word for I. They don't have this word right here, I. They only have us or we or stuff like that. They don't have these words like I or me. They don't have the word me even. And so I think this is so neat, especially from a spirituality perspective that you abandon your ego. And one of the days I was teaching, this girl Timmy was in my class who was Hopi. It's funny that her name is Timmy. And she says this, that, Tim, this is true. We don't have these words. She verified this for me. But she says there's another word we don't have in our language. And it's spelled like this, L-O-V-E. Because love is not something you say. It's something you demonstrate. It's like the most beautiful thing ever. Okay, so the last quote, no, next the last quote. Okay, seven years in Tibet, it's an older movie with Brad Pitt, but it says, like, there's a difference between our civilization and yours. You admire the man who pushes his way to the top. We admire the man who abandons his ego. Very different Western versus Eastern philosophy of embracing. Okay, Ram Dass has been to the East and heavily influenced. He says the trick is not like, you know, or the game is not about becoming somebody, pushing your way to the top. It's about becoming absolutely nobody, ridding your sense of self of self, if you will. Okay, so this next section, we did affiliation, which is just kind of think about it congregating. Attraction has to do more with like hanging out and being friends, not sexual attraction yet. Just like, hey, do you like me? I like you. We just hang out and be friends. Okay. And so with attraction, the first thing that determines or the first thing that researchers looked at was proximity, which is just really distance that you become friends with people that you're close to. But then I want to argue the internet, like, you know, kind of throws this off. So early research did focus on this, but now we have all kinds of social mechanisms where functional distance, sorry about that, functional distance isn't a priority because we can reach out across the world.
But early studies, like I said, early on, 49, he would find that this happened to me early on in Texas Tech. You know, I became friends with people on the 11th floor of the dorm I lived in. Why? Because they were on the 11th floor and I saw them all the time. And so it was just convenient. So one of the theories is nearness, probably that if you're near people like Festinger in 50s, he would see how near is your stoop to my stoop. When he looked and he measured it, and if they were only 22 feet apart, I'm not gonna ask you that distance on the test. Then those friendships develop between the married couples. So the distance had a lot to do with it. Now, Siegel in the 70s started looking at teachers that alphabetically seat people. And when they looked at people to alphabetically see uh, together, and you became friends with people whose names started with the same letter, like people, I'm La Larry is my last name, so L's would be M N, you know, whatever, <laughs> maybe some H I J K's, but you see what I'm talking about. You start becoming friends with people out of this convenient nature. Our uh, researcher started to ask why. I think I've talked about Zion's strawberry jam study. Yes, I have. He was the guy that, you know, talked about go with your gut and not with your head with the strawberry jam. But anyway, he has another theory, this Zion's guy, that one of the reasons that you become friends with people that you're close to, that's what proximity is up here close to, is that when I, he would show people just like <clears throat> random Chinese characters. Now, if you don't speak Chinese or write Chinese, I guess they don't mean anything. But if you would flash them a bunch of times, there's another one over here versus one time. Actually, that's not another one. I have a musical note that after you see it a bunch of times, you like it more for some reason than the ones you only saw a few times. I have the musical note over here. And it's because I, I think about... Uh, the first time I hear a song, maybe I like it right away, but sometimes it grows on me, right? And so the, that's the theory of proximity that people grow and you like. Sometimes people become cuter after you hang out with them for a while. And so maybe there's a limit to that too, then you get sick of it, right? Like I was just ironically listening to Led Zeppelin this morning because a lot of times I can't listen to Led Zeppelin anymore because I listened to it so much. I saturated it to where it's like, okay, that's enough of that already. I hate it. I don't completely hate it, but I can't listen to it very often. Like I used to listen to it all the time. Okay. And so mere exposure works to a certain extent to where it's like, yeah, you really like a person and you start to really have an affinity to them. But sometimes maybe it turns you off after you get sick of them, like right over here on the last of the curve, I didn't write very good. So, second one, similarity, you pick a different color. Similarity makes sense. So when you're gonna hang out with people and be friends, you should be friends with birds of a feather flock together. Okay, so Don Byrne did this thing called bogus stranger. Bogus means fake, right? You're not gonna really meet a stranger, but in his research, a paradigm is a model in his research, you show up and um, you think you're gonna meet a stranger. That's the whole shtick. There's nothing else to it. But before you meet him, they say, hey, would you fill out, and I wish I wouldn't have wrote over this, would you fill out a questionnaire um, and you have to write all this stuff down about your belief in supernatural beings, premarital sex, think about it as 1970s. Uh, favorite TV shows, whatever else. What kind of music do you listen to? And the only reason you're filling this out, they tell the person who's the participant, is to get an idea of you know what you like. And I'm going to hand it off to this other person, fake person, and they're going to fill one out and give it to you to see like are y'all going to be kind of on the same wavelength. Now hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so there's not a person in the next room, but you're filling out this questionnaire thinking, okay, I'll get his back to see if we like each other. Now, before the experiment begins, they bring in in this questionnaire, supposedly from this person that you're going to meet. Well, you're not going to meet a person. And so when they bring in this questionnaire, they purposely looked at yours and designed one that's really similar to yours, like the same musical taste, the same beliefs, maybe religious beliefs, backgrounds, or they've gone out and filled out a questionnaire that's completely opposite of yours. Now they ask you, what do you think about meeting this guy? Now you're not going to meet him, but they ask you, what is your you know, perception? Do you think you're going to work well together? Are you going to like him? And in this situation right here, you know, you start going, oh, yeah, we're going to work well together. Why birds of a feather flock together? 
Oh, here I had it on here. Participants. I got to be careful with this pen. <laughs> Participants felt like they would like the person and work well with them in this situation. Okay. Why is similarity important? It should seem commonsensical. One of the uh, ideas that Byrne, this is the same guy, Don Byrne, came out with is reinforcement affect. I hate the name of this theory, but reinforcement affect is this. That agreement is like a reward. If I like something and you like it, it's like, oh, that kind of makes us feel good because we both like it, but also you're validating that I'm right. So there's kind of a double whammy to it. It reinforces positive feelings, but it also validates my beliefs. Like this guy's gonna vote for the same guy I'm gonna vote for. So I must be right. Not only does he agree with me, we're not gonna get to a fight, so it creates harmony, but it also creates validation. This is your whole project, the hive. You know what I mean? This is why I'm so big on hive thought or hive mentality. Now, I think this is one of the very last slides. We're almost done with this section, believe it or not. So you want consistency or harmony. Let's just say we have a relationship, even if it's just a business relationship. If you always disagree, that's going to be an inconsistency. And you're going to be fighting all the time. So if I can't, I don't think I can go back on this. But in relationships, if you get into a relationship with a person and you're always disagreeing, does it have to be a romantic relationship? Well, we'll get to that later on. <laughs> then you're going to create in a, a state of dissonance constantly and that state of dissonance is going to take its toll on the relationship in both partners but if you can create consonants that's why i'm thinking you better fly into the right beehive a lot of times and this has everything to do with your project so that's everything for today i'm going to go into romantic relationships on the next uh, video lecture